Uh, hi everyone, I think I will uh, make a start. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, next uh, uh, UCL Chemical Engineering Taster lecture. Uh, the topic of today's lecture will be uh, the mixing of complex Newtonian fluids for oral healthcare applications. Basically, uh, the research I will be showing you and the work I will be showing you is relevant to toothpaste manufacturing, um, something that uh, we all use and are familiar with. Uh, my name is Panayota Angeli, and I'm heading the Thames Multiphase Research Group in the Department of Chemical Engineering. So a lot of the images I'll be showing you in uh, this presentation come from the research work we have been doing in our labs at undergraduate and postgraduate research level. Uh, for more information about our department and for the research that's going on, you can uh, follow this link here. Just a very quick overview uh, of UCL, uh, in uh, uh, case some of you have not uh, been to our website yet. Uh, UCL was founded as University of, University of London, fa was founded in 1826, and the name changed to University College London in 1836. Um, UCL was actually the first to allow women to receive degrees, and that happened in 1878 and um, uh, is closely associated our department with Sir William Ramsey. Um, you may know that uh, uh, William Ramsey won a Nobel Prize in 1904 for discovering the inert gases and uh, he also had a great interest in industrial applications of chemistry. So in his uh, um, uh, honour, the first uh, UK Chair of Chemical Engineering and the first Department of Chemical Engineering were established in 1923. So uh, just an overview of the presentation for today. Uh, what I'm going to be uh, showing you is uh, research and work and also uh, topics related to fluids and to rheology, how fluids flow. And I will particularly concentrate on these complex uh, fluids and we'll talk a little bit more later on what that means. Um, the uh, reason we have been studying these fluids is that they are uh, relevant to the manufacturing of many everyday products and in this particular case to uh, manufacturing of toothpaste. And we will cover, uh, talk a little bit about uh, how we manufacture this toothpaste and uh, mixing in both stirred vessels and in a new approach, uh, continuous mixing. And um, I will um, be showing you how, uh, what type of work we do in our labs and in our department, both experimental and numerical uh, to study these uh, fluids and also their manufacturing. And I will allow enough time in the end for questions. So uh, you uh, might be familiar from school uh, that uh, rheology is the study of fluids in motion and uh, the remove a few things to make sure everything is visible and we uh, when the fluids flow there is a certain resistance to this flow and uh, we characterize this resistance with the property viscosity so viscosity tells us how easily the fluids can flow and uh, you are all aware that for example if you have water it's much more easy to pour it but if you have something like honey for example it is a lot more difficult to pour it and this is because they have different viscosities. So, uh, sorry for that. So the, um, uh, we study viscosity using instruments like that, rheometers, and uh, um, we find out that the fluids actually have, uh, can behave in many different ways. Fluids that their viscosity does not change are called Newtonian, and our water, for example, is a Newtonian fluid. And, they, um, and this is what we get when we change the, uh, the, what we call shear rate, when we try to move these fluids faster or slower. In the rheometer here, what we do is that we have two plates and we rotate them. And as we rotate them, as we increase the rotation speed, we increase this shear rate. And then we see how this viscosity responds. There are, however, other fluids that when we change, we rotate faster, uh, they can increase, they have their viscosity increased or decreased, and they are called shear thickening or shear thinning. A very common example of shear thinning fluids is paints. Uh, you know that paints uh, are very thick when we have them in their uh, containers. 
However, when we uh, put them on a brush and we dip a brush inside the paint and we uh, try to apply it on the wall, what we do is we move the brush up and down, so we shear the fluid, and um, the paint gets thinner. And that's why it's more easy to spread it uniformly. However, when we stop doing this brushing motion, uh, the paint stays on the wall because the viscosity increases again. But apart from these shear thinning or thickening fluids, we also have fluids that behave even more, uh, have even more complex behavior. And these are called viscoelastic fluids or complex fluids because they combine properties of both the fluids and of solids. Uh, these the viscosity comes from the fluid part, while the elasticity comes from the solid part. And a very uh, interesting phenomenon uh, of this viscoelastic effect is this rod uh, climbing uh, uh, phenomenon here, effect here, that is also called Weisenberg effect, where we see we have, if we have put a rod rotating inside a viscoelastic fluid, then uh, what we see is that the fluid starts climbing up the, the road, while with a normal fluid, in donia fluid, it will just be expelled on the sides. So these are the fluids that are actually very interesting because they appear in a lot of our everyday products. Um, so we have paints that we just mentioned before in very different uh, colors as well. But uh, fluids like um, toothpaste that we're going to talk a bit more about, um, creams, and creams for the face or uh, creams for the food. Uh, all these pastes like cement and also dough that we use to make cookies and other interesting things uh, are what we call viscoelastic fluids. And often these complex fluids are suspensions, mixtures of polymers or gels in, in a liquid. Um, and on top of that, we may also add solids as well. So let's go a little bit more into the uh, toothpaste now. Um, and uh, this is a typical, let's say, uh, tip, these are typical steps of manufacturing a toothpaste. We have some gel um, that uh, often is uh, some type of polymer. Uh, a common polymer that we use in toothpaste is this carbomer. And we uh, put it, the polymer is in a solid form and we put it in a solvent, for example, polyethylene glycol. If we increase the temperature, this mixture will become a gel. Um, and then, for, uh, because we want to regulate the, the flow properties and the viscosity, we put it, we mix it with another liquid, which can be water or glycerol. Uh, water is more um, a traditional uh, fluid for toothpaste, but uh, in modern uh, um, formulations, in modern toothpaste, uh, we want to have active ingredients inside that do not see water until they reach our mouth, uh, because then they get activated. In this case, uh, we try to avoid using water in the preparation of the toothpaste, and we just use glycerol. And uh, subsequently, we may add uh, solids, uh, like silica particles, because they have properties like uh, abrasiveness to clean better, or flavors or surfactants to, to actually give the taste, the smell that uh, uh, we receive, we get when we buy uh, toothpaste. All these processes here involve mixing. And one way to do this mixing is in stirred vessels, stirred tanks. Uh, we'll see better images of that in a minute. Um, or what we call in chemical engineering, uh, we, uh, the mixing happens in batch vessels. So basically we put in the ingredients inside and we start mixing. And when the mixing is done, we think we are done, then we just empty the vessel and uh, we take the product. So this mixing here is a very important. Uh, it has to happen uh, fast, has to be uniform. We have to control the temperature in case the properties change again. Um, and these are some of the ways we use in uh, our labs to study uh, this mixing. Um, experimentally, uh, uh, we use uh, small versions of the uh, large uh, stir tanks they have in the industry. Um, and one technique we have been using extensively is this laser induced fluorescence or LIF technique, where we uh, have the stirred vessel, we have a laser and we make a laser sheet through the vessel and we observe with the camera how a fluorescent dye uh, 
uh, distributes mixes with the fluid in the vessel. Um, and uh, we can then know how quickly the mixing happens, whether it has um, uh, been uniform, uh, how long it takes. We also use uh, computational tools to start the mixing and uh, a very common uh, way uh, tool to do that is computational fluid dynamics or CFD, uh, where we actually solve within the whole vessel the, uh, the equations of motion of the fluid and we can then uh, derive, find out a lot of things. So in these schematics here, what we have plotted is the, the parts of the vessel that uh, we have velocity, the fluid velocity is at least 10% of the speed of the tip of the impeller of the vessel. And um, we see more or less all the vessel, all the fluid in the vessel is in some motion. However, if we say, we try to find out which parts of the fluid have velocity that is more than 30% of the tip, we see this is limited, there's less areas that have this velocity. And if we want to see which parts of the uh, fluid have uh, more than half the tip speed, then we see it's very much restricted, uh, very close to the impellers. And uh, for velocities very close to the tip speed, then we are really very close to the tip. So this gives us an idea of how, the, uh, how much we move the whole fluid in the vessel and can tell us, uh, um, can help us design these uh, impellers here because we really have to, we want impellers that put the whole fluid in motion and uh, make the mixing more efficient. Um, just to make a little comment here, because the, the drawing uh, allows us, these photographs allow us to see it, is that you see we have some strange impellers here. Uh, you may have come across some impellers from uh, your uh, work, your projects, your studies, but um, um, a lot of the fluids we use in the manufacturing of uh, toothpaste, as you know, are very viscous, have very high viscosity. So it's very difficult to mix them. So we have come up with designs like these, where we have double impellers. You see the top one here, the bottom here, and they also have these holes here. And these are to, uh, uh, to help the strength of the actual impeller. So the, when we do these uh, studies, we of course first to, uh, need to compare with what we get from the computational studies and from the experiments agrees. And this graph here shows uh, some uh, comparison we have done in, in uh, our lab where you see there is very good agreement actually between the experiments. This is the velocity field in a cross section of the tank and the simulations. So we trust both the experiments and the simulations. And doing works like this, experiments and simulations like this, we can also get overall parameters and plot graphs like the one I'm showing you uh, below. So what we have in this graph is the, this property, this parameter here, which we call power number, and we plot it against the, uh, this uh, parameter here, which we call Reynolds number. The power number shown in, uh, in, in this equation uh, relates is, uh, is what we call a dimensionless number that relates the power that we need to mix, to stir this mixture, and uh, it also has the density, the impeller speed, and the impeller diameter. It is dimensional number, dimensionless number, because if you try to uh, see what is the dimensions of this property, we find the, the dimensions of the, uh, the top and the bottom have canceled out. So actually there is no dimensions. And this is the Reynolds number that uh, depends on the density, the impeller speed, the impeller diameter, and the viscosity of the fluid. So, the, by plotting graphs like that, we can actually now take results from the lab, from something like this, and apply them to large industrial scale mixers. So this actually mixer is a model, a scaled down version of this larger industrial one. Because now we know that if in the large mixer we want to operate at a certain impeller speed and the diameter of this mixer is uh, we know the, the size of the impeller, then we know from this graph how much power we need to put to keep it mixed. And uh, um, this approach to actually uh, get these numbers is called dimensional analysis. And this is something you would be doing in your first year course, a course I actually teach. 
Um, and uh, this process of going from the lab to uh, the uh, pilot plant, to the plant, is called scale up. So the, the results I showed you before were with the Newtonian fluids that have constant viscosity. Now, if this video plays, we'll see what happens if we don't have Newtonian fluids, but actually uh, complex non-Newtonian fluids. So this is the mixing. Um, that uh, this is the LIF technique that I described to you before. And we see when we try to mix, uh, to put some dyes, some tracer in the Newtonian fluid, we have good mixing. If we though try to do the same thing now with the non-Newtonian viscoelastic fluid, you will see that the mixing is different. These are actually very nice uh, images. Um, they look costly, don't they? Uh, so the, uh, the mixing is not as good and takes different time. So one uh, of our um, intentions, objectives, is to actually make sure that the, uh, the design of the impeller, the mixing time, is enough to actually be able to do that. To have a good <clears throat> uh, I will uh, answer questions at the end. So, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, then uh, uh, do write them in the question and answer session, and I will try to cover them at the end. Um, also, what happens when we have uh, uh, Newtonian and viscoelastic fluids? We see here again a video um, with all these layers, with the layers of where we now have added solids in our mix. a little longer uh, <clears throat> to mix, but you see, uh, I can let it run uh, for a little longer, but you can see that the solids manage to distribute very nicely. So these are solid particles and we managed to trace them. If I now put the same uh, uh, solids uh, in a viscoelastic fluids and I let the video run a bit, you, you will see a completely different image. Um, so initially the solids need to be drawn in the vessel, but then after a while we see that the solids start uh, accumulating in certain areas of the mixer. And this is something we are uh, studying now and we try to see what exactly are the locations where they congregate. It seems to be vortices forming in the mixer and they go in the, into the heart of the vortices. But this is an effect really of the elastic part of the fluid. And uh, uh, that's why uh, complex fluids can have a lot more complex behavior when we try to mix them. Uh, so I've, uh, this is all the work we've been doing. This is a uh, summary of the work we have been doing with these batch uh, mixers that we mentioned. Uh, however, recently, and uh, there is a, a tendency in uh, uh, processing to move from what we call batch processes to continuous processes. So instead of actually putting uh, all our materials in a, in a step vessel, in a pot, mix them and then when it finishes we uh, empty it and we go to the next one. We try to do everything continuous without stopping. And uh, uh, so everything remains into flow. We mix and then we uh, add the next ingredient to be mixed. Maybe then we increase the temperature. Uh, if we want to do that, to move from batch to continuous, as we say, then it is quite important to understand also the properties of the materials. Uh, why do they behave the way they behave? How exactly their rheology changes? So in this, uh, let's say, uh, part of the presentation, I will show you some uh, studies. Uh, I'll give you an indication of how the material properties can actually help us understand, but also improve the process. So what we have uh, done uh, here is that uh, by looking at the material properties, we realized that um, if we actually mix initially our polymer, our carbomer, with the solvent, with the polyethylene glycol, as we mentioned, but at the same time also with glycerol, then and this mixture gelates much faster and also at low temperature. We don't need to increase the temperature. So we have some improvements compared to the previous process we discussed, where we first mixed polymer with the polyethylene glycol, we elevated the temperature and then we mixed with the, with the glycerol. We actually had two problems here. One in the previous process, we had to use higher temperature, which means more energy demanding. 
And also, when we generated, created the gel of the carbomer with the polyethylene glycol, this was very viscous. And when we try to mix very viscous fluids, this is also uh, very difficult and energy consuming. While if we just mix the carbomer, polyethylene glycol, and glycerol at low temperature, the viscosities are still low. We then, having done this mixing at low temperatures, we then can leave the, the mixture to um, gelate, to form a gel. And then we can add, as before, solids, flavors, surfactants. So we ha have actually done two things by studying the material properties. We um, were able to improve the process because now, as we said, we mix things, fluids in low uh, temperatures, low viscosity, so it's more efficient, more easy. Um, we avoid the increased temperature and uh, we can do that continuously. And uh, in, but not in vessels anymore, but in uh, pipes like this one. In this case, because we want to, to help mixing, we use these inline mixers, as we call them. So it is these configurations inside the pipe. This looks like a helix. I'll show you more uh, images of that in a minute. So we put the fluids here and we let them mix as we go along. Um, before we talk about the mixers, I just wanted to uh, uh, let you know uh, how do we go about studying these uh, properties of the materials. Uh, what we think it happens in this case with a toothpaste is that when we put the carbomer, the polymer, inside the fluid around it, this in the beginning is solid, quite solid actually, hard solid. And uh, um, over time, the surrounding uh, fluid starts penetrating inside the solid polymer um, chains and uh, the solid becomes swells and actually it swells so much that um, in the end the, the particles uh, start uh, touching each other. Actually, these are the gel particles and they are what you might have heard called soft particles. So they are particles, but they are quite elastic, quite soft. And here are some images that we obtained with the confocal microscope where we actually had tagged, had put a dye inside these uh, polymers originally so we could observe how they swell. And so that what happens, um, the difference between the different solvents really. So when we add the glycerol, we were able to see that the swelling was much bigger, much faster. While when we only had the original um, polyethylene glycol solution, the swelling was not as uh, good. So in this case, we would have to increase the temperature to help the swelling happen. Um, so this is how we, uh, we have a hypothesis. This is what we thought it had happened. And then by using experiments like confocal microscopy, we could actually find out that yes, indeed, this is what happens. Um, so now let's go to our continuous mixers. This is again our setup. Uh, this is a continuous flow setup. We have our, in the beginning, we just studied the mixing here without the gelation, just to see how good it is. So we have our fluids. We have one fluid uh, with some color, fluorescent dye, so we can observe it. We put them in our mixers and then using again this LIF technique I mentioned before with a laser and the camera, we can see how well mixed the fluids are at the end. So um, we can use different types of these inline mixers. This is a common one, it's called Kenix mixer. And this is a much more complex one. And um, what I show you here is a combination of numerical simulations and experiments that we have used to describe the mixing. So in this numerical simulation, we put two fluids in the beginning and you see what happens in this uh, mixer is that the fluids get cut and uh, uh, remixed. So it is a split and a combined, let's say, process. That's what we call it. So at the end of the mixer, you, as you can see, the, um, uh, the two different fluids have mixed quite a lot. And this is also what we get from the LIF uh, results. So when we get to this point, then diffusion, the molecules will try to actually of one fluid will try to get into the other to have the entirely uniform mixing. And we see what is the behavior of this type of mixer now. Again, we start with two fluids and we see what, what we have in the end. What I want to show you here uh, towards the end of my presentation is that what I showed you for the mixers before again applies to uh, Newtonian fluids, very viscous Newtonian fluids. But uh, when we have 
let me see if I can try and run both issues at the same time. But when we have non-Newtonian fluids, viscoelastic fluids, um, if I can go back one slide, when we have Newtonian fluids at the end of this mixer, this is the image we get. The mixing has progressed so far and is good. But when we have now these viscoelastic fluids, we see that at the end of the mixer, we don't actually get as good mixing. And we see this uh, sort of breathing of uh, the materials. This variation implies instabilities. With the viscoelastic fluids, the, um, the, uh, the flows are not stable anymore. They change over time. They're not steady. So, um, and this is because there are instabilities that have to do with the, uh, the way the, uh, the gels um, or the viscoelastic fluids behave when do they see the different parts of the mixer. Uh, so it is actually uh, these images, this information helps us to um, try to design mixers that um, when we have viscoelastic fluids, we can still overcome this uh, sort of uh, um, uh, phenomena and achieve a good mixing. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, let me see if I can actually leave that here. So this is um, um, a photograph from uh, the front court of UCL. Um, so if, uh, some of the people in uh, uh, the research group, and I would like in particular to, to thank Dr. Wehili, Dr. Cortada, uh, Simona Migliosi and Giovanni Meridiano that uh, they produce some of the results I showed you before. Um, and I will stop here and uh, try to answer questions. So um, what uh, I will do, uh, you can keep sending your questions. And uh, what I will do is that I will try to go through the list of questions that have already been uh, uh, sent um, and yeah, try to answer them. Right, how do you find the velocity of the liquids in the experiments? Maybe uh, I will go back to one figure actually, but uh, maybe I should uh, uh, reply to the second question first, which is what are examples of Newtonian fluids? So Newtonian fluid is water. This is the simplest example. Uh, so any, uh, uh, the, there are fluids, for example, if you have a very dilute all the juices you have in the fridge, if they, they're very dilute, they would be Newtonian fluids. Um, even very thick fluids, glycerol, for example, if you have uh, uh, used it in, uh, in your labs at all of your experiments, is a Newtonian fluid. The thing is that a lot of the, all the other fluids in our everyday life have some non-Newtonian element. Um, the dyes we mentioned, um, the... Uh, all of the, uh, everything that, uh, all the cosmetics uh, that we use, uh, sauces we have in, uh, in our uh, fridge for the, uh, for the food that are non-Newtonian. And it's usually um, fluids that are mixtures of uh, liquid and either a polymer inside, the gel particles, or uh, um, suspensions. Uh, so of, um, um, yeah, I'm just trying to see if I missed anything. So um, now, how do you find the velocity of the liquid in the experiments? Is there a particular device? I will, what I will do is I'll go a little bit back to my slides, uh, if I uh, can. Maybe what I, it might be easier if I go to this uh, uh, mode and I'll go to, back to this experiment. Uh, right. So um, there are many ways to measure velocities. Um, and one of them is called particle image velocimetry that we've been using quite a lot. Uh, in this case, what we do is that, um, and that's how we obtain the velocities in our experiment. Um, it, what you do, we do is that we put seeding particles, very, very small uh, micro uh, micro sized particles in the flow. And what we do is that we take images, but uh, very close to each other, high speed images. And then we uh, use these two successive images and we see how far the particles have moved from one image to the other. And from this motion of the particles, we can uh, derive the velocity at this point. Okay, we, what we call the way 
the, this technique is called cross correlation. So we basically have two images and we try to cross correlate them as we call it to see uh, what are the velocities. But basically we try to see where do particles move from one image to the other. The, this, the, the actual distance, but also the direction, because that would give us the velocity vector. And uh, doing that, we can get um, these velocity vectors in, in the vessel, and we can compare them with the CFD. Um, okay, uh, now, when the solids clamp in the complex fluids, could this just be due to random movement of the particles? being a probability of being close together, similar to diffusion, where concentrations may also increase due to the random motion? The answer is no. Um, it, co it could be a lot of um, phenomena uh, affecting the motion of the particles. So what we have actually done here is that we have ensured that these two vessels of Newtonian and non-Newtonian of viscoelastic fluids have everything else the same, let's say. So the Reynolds numbers are the same that we mentioned before. So we know that the, the mixing velocities should be similar and the particles are the same. And um, I didn't mention all the details, but actually the particles here are what we call neutrally bioned. So they wouldn't tend to just precipitate or uh, on their own. Uh, they match the density of the, of the liquid, the background liquid. So because we have this very good comparison, and we see that in this case here, we managed to have good mixing, then this leads us to the assumption, and there is other evidence also in literature uh, to, uh, to help, uh, to, to suggest that, that it is actually the, this, the elastic properties of the fluid that tend to, to push the particles in certain areas of the vessel. Um, right, next question. As mixing takes place, there may be solids getting close together, hence causing the product to lose its consistency. Is there any way we can prevent this from happening? This is actually the holy grail, let's say, of, of mixing. Um, and there are, the, the whole study can be quite um, uh, tricky. There can be a lot of uh, uh, phenomena uh, occurring. Um, sort of implied a little bit in the previous um, uh, uh, question. The particles we have been using in our experiments, because we mainly wanted to see where do they go, they don't attach to each other. It is quite possible that uh, in, um, uh, in real life we may have particles that also have a, a DC forces, so if they come close together they might aggregate or they might repel. Um, so uh, yes, this is true. If, the, if we have mixing and the solids just stay in one side, uh, they congregate in one place, then the mixing is not good. And we have to try to avoid that. Um, and that's why we studied. This is what happens, but we don't want that. On the other hand, if uh, your intention, so this is the observation of the phenomenon, but if your intention, if our intention is actually to separate solids from a liquid, then perhaps this is the best way to do that because by adding some polymer in the liquid, we make it viscoelastic and then uh, um, but just by mixing it, we may be able to get rid of the solids that are inside. So we know the fundamentals, we try to understand the, the issues, the fundamental um, uh, phenomena that, that uh, characterize this phenomenon and then we see how does that affect your application, our application. So, um, Right, next question. How does shear thinning or shear thickening happen? This, uh, the, the uh, shear thinning is perhaps a bit more easy to, to understand. Uh, it happens, uh, polymers are often long chains, uh, molecules that have long chains. Um, if, we, if they are in their relaxed, let's say, state, then uh, they would be uh, coiled. So when we start flowing a solution that has polymers, one thing that happens is that we make uh, the polymer stretch. So they actually align with the flow. And this means they can flow easier. And this is the shear thinning behavior. Shear thickening is perhaps a bit more easy, difficult to, to understand, but it goes to what I was telling you before about particles having uh, perhaps uh, 
uh, attractive forces between them. So if we have a, a mixture that contains particles and by uh, putting it in motion, by sharing it, putting it into flow, the particles tend to come closer together. They might form, form these aggregates we mentioned that would make the flow more difficult. And this is where the shear thickening comes into. Um, so yeah, helical mixers. Um, these, the on site showed you, so the question is, are helical mixing reactors or uh, mixers stationary or rotating? So the ones I showed you are stationary. They are static mixers. Uh, it is a possibility um, it's, uh, to, to also have them rotating. Um, yeah, and that's that. So you include an, um, another element to help the mixing. Uh, so the, the next question is, does the viscosity of the water change when temperature is decreased, say four degrees uh, Celsius? If it doesn't become a solid, yeah, I mean, the, all the viscosities of all fluids are temperature dependent of all liquids. Um, and um, I can uh, talk a bit more about that. And it's actually one uh, uh, thing we will uh, uh, deal with in, uh, again in the course I did in the first year in transfer phenomena. Um, uh, why is uh, the viscosity increased or decreased with the temperature? Um, one, uh, uh, so in some liquids, the, uh, the effect of temperature is uh, higher, in some is less high. Um, you know, honey, I mean, I don't know if people like honey, you know that um, uh, if you want to pour it in, in sweets, then uh, you actually heat it up because then the viscosity uh, decreases and it's much more easy to pour. Um, uh, with the water, the change in viscosity is not tremendous. Water has a very low viscosity um, compared to a lot of uh, other fluids. Um, what, what is interesting, and we will be explaining that in our uh, transport phenomena course, is that in gases, uh, gases also have viscosity, very low, but in gases, the, the viscosity increases with temperature rather than decreases. I have a question which says, which models are used for the CFD simulation? Um, it is quite a general question. So uh, what we have been doing here is that we, um, uh, in the simulations I showed you, the, these are single phase simulations. So we have only one background fluid. And what we had to do is that we uh, had to actually import the viscosities. And this is this slide here, for example we had to import the viscosities that we measured with our rheometers to be able to uh, match the experiments. Uh, so a lot of, uh, we did a lot of work here trying to fully characterize the viscosities of the, uh, of the, uh, of the fluids we were uh, using. Um, I am not quite sure, I don't know if you want to uh, to repeat this question. There was a question that says, what surfactants? Um, I, uh, I don't uh, have the names with me, if that's what you mean, or I'm not sure if you mean what is surfactants. Uh, if you want to repeat the question, I'll go back to that uh, in a minute. <clears throat> what other processes use mixing of non-Newtonian fluids? Um, I, I will come back to, to actually this uh, figure for this one. Um, all the cream products we have, uh, either face creams or food creams, use non-Newtonian fluids. Um, and these are fluids because they flow. Uh, they are very viscous fluids. Um, so. As I said here, most fluids that have suspensions that include either some polymers inside or um, gels or particles will have some non-Newtonian behavior or viscoelastic behavior. So it's a lot of, if you look around at home, it's a lot of uh, the, uh, the products you are using at home would be uh, non-Newtonian fluids. Uh, Okay, could the induced polarity be a reason why the solids would cover over time? Um, 
again, the, the answer is no in this case because our experiments, uh, we, we try to take that into account. What would polarity do is that it would affect the um, attractive forces we mentioned or, uh, or um, um, uh, repelling both forces. If you start having some polarity, then as the particles come close together, they might want to stay together or uh, be repelled. Um, one more is what advantages does continuous mixing have over batch mixing? Uh, let me go in this one here for this question. So the, um, uh, let me just show that to you. This is a long discussion, I would say, in chemical engineering, um, which is uh, batch versus continuous. The, a lot of pharmaceutical companies um, have been using um, batch processes uh, for, for various reasons. I mean, first of all, the, the mixing in, in stirred vessels like this one is a lot more understood than in, in a continuous uh, case. Um, and also the, the batch sometimes allows you, the, makes it easy if you don't want to mix, let's say, batches of uh, materials. So uh, fluids are put in or mixtures are put in a vessel. Once the process is finished, it's emptied, it's cleaned, the next one goes in. And uh, you can also, uh, if you want, um, use a smaller uh, amount of, uh, of materials. One, uh, some of the problems with bad systems are, first of all, that it is, a, it, it takes a more time to actually make it more uniform. As you can see, the whole, uh, configuration here is, is not very uniform. So some parts of the vessel will be mixed faster, some parts of the fluid will be mixed a lot faster, some parts will be less, uh, will take longer to get well mixed. So if you have things like reactions happening, for example, and uh, there are consecutive uh, reactions, then it is quite important to make sure that all your material, your uh, reactants stay there for a specific time. If you leave it longer, maybe some other reactions will happen and then you start forming um, uh, products that you don't really want, uh, waste. So this uniformity of mixing is an issue. Um, another thing is that because you do have a bulk uh, like that, if uh, um, you want to uh, change the temperature, is again a challenge because uh, heating can only happen, for example, in the toothpaste we discussed, there are heating uh, jackets around the vessels so uh, heating happens from the walls and has to propagate all the way to the center. So there is uniform, can be a non-uniform temperature inside your vessel. Again, which can affect your properties if you have a reaction, the reaction rate and so on. When we now move to um, these continuous, uh, let's say, um, processes, systems, these are usually done in, uh, uh, because we keep the flow going, we can have the same amount going through. But um, so the, these sizes can be much smaller. Vessels like that can be uh, 600 liters, even bigger. This is a, uh, some typical size for the manufacturing of toothpaste. While this one can be like, uh, this size here can be a few centimeters. So what that means is that um, um, because of the configuration as well, the mixing conditions can be more uniform as we move along. And also it's much more easy if we want to heat it from the outside, for example, because we want a certain temperature inside, it's much more easy to, uh, to change the temperature uh, and to have it more uniform along uh, the mixer. Um, I hope that answered your question. So there was one question, uh, does pressure affect the viscosity of liquids? Uh, not so, no, for liquids, but it does affect a lot the viscosity of uh, gases. So, um, I, these are the questions I have. I thought there was a raised hand, but I'm not quite sure um, how, uh, if the question was answered in uh, the question and answer session we had, or if it is something additional. Um, right. 
Uh, is there any, um, we, we are still here, if people have any additional questions, more general um, about, uh, so what I presented you here is actually work that happens in, in our labs and our students get involved uh, with the uh, research in the labs, uh, mainly through their final year uh, research project. Uh, and we had students being involved in uh, this work on the solids mixing, for example, and uh, in um, the rheology studies that I showed you uh, before we had projects uh, this year and the previous years on these rheological studies. Um, and then, of course, if uh, people uh, are keen to, to continue and stay for research in a PhD level, then um, a lot of this work is done through PhD projects as well. Um, is there any other questions from the participants? Um, uh, maybe then I can say a few more things that uh, uh, because these are related to, to the course I'm teaching also in the first year. We talk a bit about a uh, fluid flow um, and uh, one of the uh, things we cover is uh, this dimensional analysis I mentioned uh, here. So how do we find the important parameters, important dimensional numbers that describe our uh, systems of interest? So these two dimensional numbers are very important for mixing. Um, and also how do we go about uh, this scale lab? How do we translate results from the lab, which is the extensive uh, research we've done here, to uh, something industrial? It is quite difficult in a vessel like this with uh, solid walls, to actually get this degree of detail of information. So we really need to do this work in the lab and then move the results, translate the results to uh, the large scale. And this is also where our collaboration with uh, industry comes in because the, all these studies uh, reflect industrial problems. In this case, in the manufacturing of toothpaste, but as I said, uh, a lot of uh, consumer goods uh, and foods are actually involving these types of um, uh, a complex fluids. Right, okay, what is the material property that causes the elastic behavior of the fluids? It's actually the fact that it is um, uh, a mixture of not just one fluid, but for example, you have the polymer chains inside. If you think what happens is that um, when you stretch uh, a polymer, as we said, in the flow, you have the polymeric chain and it is stretched. So uh, this in a way uh, 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 saves some energy, elastic energy within your polymer chain. So this one then um, can um, reflect to how this polymer will behave when it uh, goes inside your vessel from a region where it stretched a lot, for example, around this impeller end or an impeller tip and in an area where there's not so much stretching. So this causes this unusual behavior we see. Are there any optimization studies carried out to enhance the geometry of the impeller or help the reactor for better mixing? Um, so this is uh, ongoing and uh, uh, optimization um, in the sense that we uh, try to, um, to check different, a lot of different geometries is, is one option of doing that. Um, there is um, a lot of work in, in research on how we can actually uh, couple, as we call it, results like this, very detailed results that come from either experiments or simulations. Uh, with optimization codes that uh, you use in process systems engineering and, um, and find out what is, for example, the best uh, impeller configuration. It is very computationally demanding. So one way to go about it is to um, use this very detailed fundamental information to derive certain uh, um, easier uh, models or uh, smaller models. For example, that the mixing time with this impeller configuration is, uh, uh, is related to the impeller speeds through a correlation, which we can then use perhaps in an optimization tool and um, try to go through different scenario. 
but there is also intention, there is also work where uh, these simulations are coupled with optimization tools. Just that the whole thing can take very long to, uh, to produce a result. So the, the best approach, the better approach is to learn from all these fundamentals, derive some simpler models that we can then use in optimization tools to yeah, improve the performance, change perhaps the operating conditions, mixing longer time, change the temperature and get a better mixing. And the same for the helical reactor as well. I don't have any other questions on my question and answer uh, section. If there is no more questions, maybe we can uh, give a closure to this taste lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I hope uh, to see yeah, some, all of you, uh, at some point in the new academic year. And uh, good luck with all your um, um, exams and the results, I think, now. Uh, and yeah, enjoy the rest of your summer as well. I think most of your hard work for this year has uh, happened already.